also led to velocities that were vastly larger than the speed of light, if by velocity you meant the rate at which the size of the universe was expanding. Yeah. Yeah. The phenomenon sounds analogous to our modern economic problems. Probably. Is that the, related to the horizon problem? Or we can't it is related to the horizon problem, oh, which I'll be coming back to. Yeah. Uh, yes? A, a follow-up, though. Um, at that time frame, though, was the, best way to say it, is, was the physical law of the speed of light applicable? I mean, did it exist at that instant? Right. Uh, yeah, the important question, of course, is, is, is can we trust what we know about the laws of physics when applied to these ridiculously early times? Uh, and uh, I think the answer is we have no way of knowing for sure, uh, but the way the game of cosmology is played is to try to apply the laws of physics that we know up to these early times and try to figure out what we expect the universe to end up looking like if those assumptions are true, because we don't know what other assumptions to make, uh, at least not until the, the first assumptions you might try turn out to lead to something that's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as we can tell so far, uh, when we apply the laws of physics that we know of to the early universe, they still work. Mm -hmm. uh, the first big success of this sort really was the issue I mentioned early on in my talk about the calculation of the abundances of the light chemical elements. Uh, that depends on knowing that nuclear physics, the exact cross-sections for neutrinos scattering off of electrons mm -hmm. and producing muons and all that stuff, uh, you had to assume it was exactly the same a few minutes after the Big Bang or even a few seconds after the Big Bang uh, as it would be in the laboratory today. And of course, the conditions a few seconds after the Big Bang were vastly different from anything you could really recreate in the laboratory today. But nonetheless, it gave results that worked. Uh, and similarly, I'll show you with inflation and 10 to the minus 35 seconds, it's all much more difficult to believe, uh, but we still get some consequences out of this which work. Uh, so that's the game. That's the way the game is played, uh, and it could, of course, at some point turn out to be wrong, uh, but so far it hasn't. It hasn't in, in a visible way. Okay. Onward. Okay. So I want to describe to you three successes of this inflationary model. Uh, three reasons why one might very well believe, why I believe, and many other cosmologists believe. Maybe not quite all, but a large number. Uh, believe that the universe really did this, uh, because the universe has signs that seem to indicate that that's where it came from. Uh, so the first of these issues I want to talk about is what's called the horizon homogeneity problem. Uh, and that's the statement that inflation can explain the observed uniformity of the universe, which is very hard to explain otherwise. And this actually comes back to the egg thing as well, really. Uh, if you didn't have inflation, but just had some kind of an explosion, even if you didn't think it started in even if you thought it started about as uniform as you could Im imagine it starting, it's still hard to understand how the universe got to be as uniform uh, as it actually is observed to be. Uh, the universe is observed to be incredibly uniform. Uh, the uniformity is seen most strikingly in the cosmic background radiation, this 2.7 degree radiation that seems to fill the universe. And I'll be talking more about it later. Uh, that radiation has now been measured extraordinarily accurately uh, what the intensity is uh, for all directions in the sky. Uh, it's found that that radiation is uniform for all directions in the sky uh, to an accuracy of one part in a hundred thousand, uh, which really is unbelievably uniform. Uh, to be completely precise here, I should maybe qualify this a little bit. When you first go and measure the radiation, you find that it's non-uniform at the level of about one part in a thousand, with one direction being hot and the other opposite direction being a little bit cold relative to the mean. Uh, but that one part in a thousand effect can be explained by assuming that the Earth is moving through the cosmic background radiation. And you expect it to be, because the galaxy is rotating, our galaxy is moving, you know, clusters of other galaxies, and so on. And the kind of velocities that one sees are, are typical of those uh, galactic motion velocities. Uh, so it's easy to believe that that is the right explanation for this one part in a thousand effect. And it has a distinct angular pattern. You can calculate exactly what the angular pattern uh, of the temperature should be if it's caused by motion of the Earth through the cosmic background radiation. Uh, and to an extraordinary degree of accuracy, that's what we see. Uh, so we fit, uh, we, we calculate what the velocity of the Earth must be through the cosmic background radiation by observing this non-uniformity uh, and subtract that out. 
uh, and then ask the question of what are the residual non-uniformities that we cannot explain by the motion of the Earth through the cosmic background radiation. Uh, so those residual non-uniformities you really have to attribute to non-uniformities of the radiation itself, and that's the one part in 100,000. That's what you're left with after you correct the motion of the Earth through the cosmic background radiation. Uh, so the question is, can we understand how the universe got to be so uniform? Uh, now, this radiation that we're seeing is really just a glow of hot matter. So what we're seeing is that it's the same temperature everywhere. Uh, we do, of course, know that things tend to come to a uniform temperature. If we let the air in this room sit for long enough and none of us breathed and nobody moved, the air would come to a very uniform temperature after a while. Uh, that's sometimes called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Because the number one had already been used for something else. Uh, so a question you could ask is, could the universe have gotten to have a uniform temperature in that way? Uh, was there enough time for the universe to just come to a uniform temperature uh, through this normal thermal equilibrium uh, evolution? Uh, the answer turns out to be a resounding no. Uh, there was not enough time for the early universe to get uniform in that way. Uh, and you can calculate that it would require uh, energy and information uh, to travel about 100 times the speed of light in order for the universe uh, to make itself uniform early enough to be consistent with our observations uh, if it didn't start out uniform. Now you could of course assume, if you don't know anything else, or uh, you could always assume that the universe just started out uniform, uh, and that's really what was done in the context of this conventional Big Bang Theory. Uh, but if one wants to have dynamical mechanisms to explain why the universe is so uniform, uh, in the conventional Big Bang Theory without inflation, there's really no way you can do that just because of this barrier about the speed of light. There's no way for the energy to even itself out if it did not start out uniform. Uh, inflation makes that very different because of the exponential expansion. Uh, because of the exponential expansion, uh, inflationary models of the universe start out much, much smaller uh, than the conventional Big Bang Theory. Uh, and there was plenty of time, therefore, uh, when the universe was tiny just before inflation started uh, for that region to become uniform in temperature uh, by the same kind of processes by which the air in the room would become uniform if you let the room sit for a long time. Uh, and then inflation takes over and takes this tiny uniform patch and stretches it out to be the size of a marble at the end of inflation and the size of the observed universe today. Uh, and the uniformity is preserved by that expansion. So inflation pr gives us a very natural explanation uh, for how the universe got to be uh, so incredibly uniform. While otherwise, in a conventional theory, you'd really have to just postulate that uniformity uh, as having been here from the beginning. Yeah? Can you further define uniformity for me? Because you have strings of galaxies. Yeah, lumpiness. Lumpiness, are you saying it's a combination of the dark matter and the stuff we see that makes it uniform? Yeah, no, I should define it more carefully, you're right. Um, uh, it's a question of scale. Um, on the scale of galaxies, certainly it is lumpy. Uh, a galaxy is a lumpy thing. A galaxy is a lump of matter in the midst of empty space around it. Uh, so the uniformity of the universe, when I say the universe is uniform, what I really mean is if you average over a big enough piece of space, is uniform. And that big enough piece of space is much bigger than a galaxy. Uh, that's on the order of uh, a few hundred million light years. And a galaxy is about uh, uh, 100,000 light years across. Um, so um, <coughs> if you average over these big chunks, uh, as far as we can tell, the a total amount of matter in a big chunk here and in a big chunk here and a big chunk there is the same. Uh, now, we can't measure that extraordinarily accurately, but as far as we can tell, that's a true statement. And as I said, the most precise measurement that we can do accurately concerning large-scale uniformity is to observe the cosmic background radiation, uh, which is the furthest away thing that we can see, actually. If you trace the microwave background radiation back to its source, to where it was first emitted, that those are the furthest things that we're capable of seeing. Uh, and they look unbelievably uniform. And the matter that's closer is consistent with uniformity if you average over large enough regions. 